Be inspired, supported, and empowered. This is the Global Healthy Living Foundation Podcast Network. I think I carried the embarrassment for a really long time because I didn't want to be seen as someone who was sick. I wanted to compete with everybody else. I didn't want to have an excuse for not being able to keep up with everyone else. And so I tried to hide it from everyone. Welcome to Talking Head Pain, the podcast that confronts head pain head on. I'm your host, Joe Ko, Director of Therapeutic Area Growth and Integration at the Global Healthy Living Foundation, as well as co-president of GHLF Canada. I've been a migraine patient for over 20 years, so I know firsthand how debilitating this disease can be. Today I'm here with Ravi Akiani, who is a person who's lived with migraine for her entire life. Today we're going to learn about how her personal and professional life has been impacted by migraine and the unique ebbs and flows that she's experienced living with migraine disease. How are you doing today, Rabia? I'm great. Thanks for having me, Joe. It's nice to be here. Uh, my pleasure. So I want to jump right into a question that I ask a lot of folks before we begin. Can you explain to our audience in a couple of sentences what your worst migraine attack felt like? What went through your head? What were you thinking? Oh, the worst migraine attack I had was probably one of my earlier migraines when I was much younger, where I probably didn't know what was happening and I thought I was going to die. It was this feeling that my head was going to explode. I do remember distinctly my brother being called into the room, and I just remember using my arms to hold my head really tightly together. And my brother, who's just only a couple of years older than me, having to come in to keep me calm. But I remember thinking my brain was going to swell up so big and just explode. I was just that much pressure and pain. Yeah, that's a really scary thing, especially as a child. How old were you when you started to get migraines and then diagnosed? I was 10 or 11 when I first started having headaches. And we went to my family doctor, who wasn't terribly surprised that I was I was having headaches. I'm one of five kids, and my mom had migraines. So I don't think he was surprised that one of us was you know, genetically going to be inclined to have migraines or headaches. It was just something that was tracked. You know, is this a headache? Is this a one-off thing? And so for a few months, it was kind of followed. And he did try to determine whether or not it was too young kind of to be hormonal. And so it was just like, what is bringing these on? And how did it feel as a young person in school living with head pain and the related symptoms of migraine? To be honest, I was really embarrassed. I think I carried the embarrassment for a really long time because I didn't want to be seen as someone who was sick. Because from the outside, I was pretty fine, but I didn't want to be seen as somebody who was less than. I wanted to compete with everybody else. I didn't want to have an excuse for not being able to keep up with everyone else. And so I tried to hide it from everyone, actually. I remember that that was kind of my initial feeling. And when did you start to change that feeling in your life? Honestly, I don't know if it's ever gone away, you know, like there'll still be moments actually when we have like a family event, you know, coming up and I won't say that I have a migraine. I'll just self-medicate. I get embarrassed having to be that person that's not feeling well, that has the migraine, even though I think it's because it's so, you know, it happens still so frequently. I don't like the reaction that I get from someone that's like, you have a migraine again? Even though I don't think it comes from a bad place, I still have a stigma, even though I know people love me. But I have let go of a lot of friends who I have, haven't been able to see because I've canceled because I have a migraine. I used to make a lot of sacrifices where I would show up to dinners and nights out, even though I wasn't feeling well, medicated. And I just wasn't valued for the sacrifice that I made. And I've let go of those people wholeheartedly. And I do not regret that at all. I think it's so important, and thank you for being honest about this process, for people to hear that a successful woman, and we'll learn a little bit more about your career and how you're looking to sit for the New York bar, a successful woman who's traveled the world, who has had all these opportunities and is strong and empowered, and still because of stigma and the way society treats people with invisible diseases, feels that you haven't quite fully reconciled the fact that you can't be totally honest without feeling 
something negative inside of you. And I think it's important to be gentle with ourselves and for our audience to remember that it's okay to not feel like you're doing everything right or that you're perfect because it's a process living with a chronic disease. So I really appreciate that openness. Wanted to jump in a little bit into how your migraine attacks changed and progressed based on access. In talking with you before we did the interview, you talked about in different points in your life where you had different levels of access to treatments and how the access to treatments, there was a direct relationship to better outcomes for you and quality of life. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll just quickly summarize. So when I was younger, what was available, I guess, back in the 80s, and maybe it was because of my age, what was available was kind of a cocktail of medication, and it was over-the-counter medication. And that was while I was here in Toronto. When I was a little bit older, what was more available were preventatives, and that was while I was living in Australia. And there was more of a I think an understanding, and that was in the early 2000s. And I, by then I was kind of in my early to mid 20s. And I felt there was a really great understanding of migraine then because I didn't have to jump through so many hoops. I didn't have to see a neurologist. And it was at an, with an on-campus doctor at my law school. And, you know, we went through a few tests and he had my history and I was able to have a preventative medication. And it was, it dramatically changed my health and the way that I approached life. I also, I was living in a part of Australia where the weather was quite consistent and I was really sensitive to weather. And so the barometric pressure was quite consistent. I had very few migraines, but when the weather did shift, the preventative really did kick in. And I was also sensitive to hormonal uh, migraines. And so I kind of had a really great quality of life for the most part. As I shifted into my late 20s, my early 30s, I had really high stress career, but by then I was kind of back in Toronto and my access to healthcare shifted again in a different way. I didn't have access to medication and different areas of maybe medication that I would have liked to have. And so I kind of had to rely on a mismatch of medication and I kind of had to do a little bit more on my own. Like I really had to get a bit more physical, do a little bit more yoga, things like this to try and help myself. Actually, I really had to wait for doctor's appointments quite a bit, actually. It was like a three-month to six-month waiting list to get access to specialists. And my career was really busy. I was really high stress. I then moved to Abu Dhabi. And again, really consistent weather there. Barometric pressure wasn't so much of an issue. And I had access to private health care. And all of a sudden, my migraines and my access to medicine improved dramatically in a different sense as well. And I was back on preventatives that were available under their drug regulations. And my health improved dramatically. And I also started to partner it with a lot of alternative therapies because they were available in a really progressive way there. And so I was able to do things that I didn't think were necessarily possible. I had my first son there. When we decided to consider expanding our family, I did do a round of IVF. Things that migrainers, I think, don't necessarily consider doing because it may trigger a lot more risk to their migraine health. And so I did have a really great health experience there because my access to a different level of drugs and alternative therapies was just available. How does it feel knowing that you have had these treatments that have worked for you and you've been really successful on them and knowing that you can't access them in Canada? It's hard. So now that I've come back, the medication that I was on isn't available here. It is available in the U.S. And so to get these things approved is, you know, it's a different ball game. And again, I'm not familiar with how to get access to this kind of medication. And it is really difficult. My migraine health has declined considerably in the last few years since I moved back. And it is really hard and it causes a lot of stress because you can, there's things that you plan for. You have certain milestones you need to achieve. And you mentioned like the New York bar. I was meant to sit it earlier. And after several months of, you know, an influx of horrible weather that we experienced over the winter, I had to delay an exam because I literally had weeks of nonstop migraines where I was medicating. And so it is really frustrating. And I feel for people who get on new medication and it takes months until you actually find the right dose or 
I read about it all the time in our various advocacy groups where people just can't find the right thing for them after they've spent years. You know how long it takes to find a medication that works for you that doesn't have these detrimental side effects only for you to like maybe relocate or have to, you know, you just can't then switch it up. And it's really frustrating. You've just lost years of your life trying to find something. So it's kind of depressing, to be honest with you. And on top of your physical decline, yeah, you have days where you're like, you're furious. Especially when you know that this works for me. Yeah, I, I absolutely have days where I'm just, I am furious. And then there's days where I'm just like, okay, I've had this for, you know, over 30 years and I'm probably gonna have this unless like, I don't know, like the hormonal part is gonna kick in and it'll be gone in 10 years. Like there's hope. And sometimes I think of my mom who passed away last year and I think, God, she had this for like, 60 years and she was okay i can do this for another 30 years it's fine like you just kind of you almost have to just keep telling yourself like people have it worse like i'll be okay i can hide this a little bit longer it's fine it could be worse i'm very sorry about your loss you can live with migraine for another 30 years but you shouldn't have to that's really kind of you. I appreciate you saying that. It's nice to be able to talk to someone who understands. I feel like I'd love to say that there's some hope for us. I am a hopeful person. I'm a generally optimistic person. And I want to be optimistic because when I see young people that are coming up and you hear their stories, you want to be able to tell them, oh, we're going to figure this out. You're not going to be my age dealing with this. There's no way because we'll have figured it out by then. Another aspect of your story that I wanted to highlight you talked about how you used a lot of over-the-counter medications, both as directed by a physician, but also you use the term self-medicating. And you developed what uh, some call medication overuse headache or a rebound headache or medication adaptation headache. How did that impact your migraine journey? I think that's probably one of my biggest regrets. And that goes to the fact that I was really embarrassed about having migraines. So I did I did use a lot of medication to hide having migraines. And it was widely available. Like it was over the counter for the most part. And it was terrible. And I distinctly remember having to go through um, periods of time that were really high stress. So I would medicate, medicate, medicate for like days, 10 days, 12 days at a time when I would have a migraine. And then the rebound would kick in and I would continue to medicate, medicate, and then I would just crash. And there would be like a two, three day period where I was just in my apartment, just sick, just sick, almost like, like I would have, my brother would show up and he'd be like, what, like you're recovering from a re we're really, really bad migraine. And I'm like, oh yeah, it's really, really bad migraine. And it would be just horrible. And I think to myself, and it wasn't because I was, it was because I just was trying to keep up at work. It was really just that. It wasn't like I was like living my best life. It was because I was trying to maintain deadlines at work or something like that, you know? And for those who want to learn more about that topic, we had on Talking Head Pain a neurologist, Dr. Alan Rappaport, talk about medication overuse headache and his research. And it's a really tough thing because on one end, you're living in pain, you have the migraine, you're using the medication that's available. On the other hand, if you have newer treatments that might reduce the opportunity for a rebound, that would be better. But you also have access issues, as many people do to get these newer treatments. So it's a real catch-22 for migraine patients. And, you know, you're stuck between a rock and a hard place. Do I use the over-the-counter medication if I can't get access to the medication that might not cause the same amount of rebound or medication adaptation to my migraine? So really challenging topic. And then getting patients off of the over-the-counter drugs or even the prescribed acute drugs that are being used that are a little bit older and might have different mechanisms of action. But I am not the expert. I am not a doctor. Maybe have listened to the episode with Dr. Alan Ravaport. It was amazing. Rabia, before we end, is there anything that I didn't ask that you would like to share? No, I mean, God, just I hope that this helps somebody out there that is suffering from migraine, that they're definitely not alone. I think we all, anybody who's out there that comes into migraine, whether it's when they were young, whether unfortunately they're coming into it later, we're all in our journey somehow, I think, made mistakes or or figuring it out. I mean, I still make mistakes where I think to myself, I could have taken something earlier and prevented the migraine instead of like trying to tough it out. Or we all, I think, make mistakes during our journey. But I think it's just being kind to ourselves 
I think that's the key. I so agree. Yeah. I struggle with the taking the medication at the right time, too. It's like, why am I waiting? I, but you wait because you're like, do I really need it? I get a certain amount a month for these. And is this a not, you know, should I, am I going to need more next month? And it's a game that we shouldn't have to play. But yeah, really listening to your healthcare provider, sharing decisions with them, being open really helps. And I so appreciate you coming on, sharing your experience and your strength and being vulnerable with us today. It's important for people to hear and feel that because we're not alone. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for engaging a wider community. It's really kind of you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Talking Head Pain, the podcast that confronts head pain head on. This podcast was made possible with support from Abby Canada. If you have any questions, thoughts, or suggestions for us, you can send us an email at podcast at ghlf.org. If you enjoyed this episode, please give it an honest five-star rating, write a positive review, and spread the word by sharing it with your friends and family. It'll help more people like you find us. I'm Joe Coe, and I will see you next time. Be inspired, supported, and empowered. This is the Global Healthy Living Foundation Podcast Network.